I am unashamed. What about you? You ready for this? That's the song you need to play. Yep. So I, a few podcasts back, um, I mentioned that I had a joke that I was considering telling during my sermon at WFR. As it turned out, I never, I didn't use it. One is because you and Zach didn't think it was funny, although Dad did, which I appreciate that. Dad. Uh, so I Zach never. Zach and Jace. Yeah, yeah. Zach and Jace. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, but the joke was, I told it to the environmental conference I went to, and because I had literally almost run into Anthony Fauci in the airport. Oh, we're going down that one again? Yeah, well, because I found out later there have a lot of our listeners have sent comments that I haven't heard yet, but Zach has seen them. So I wanted to hear what the audience thought. But the, just to refresh, in case you missed that, that uh, oh, podcast. Let's, let's relive it. So the joke was, <laughs> I had three observations <laughs> about Fauci. One is he was very short. Mm-hmm. Two, he was surrounded by big, meat, beefy bodyguards. And third, he was wearing a mask. And then I said, this was the joke. Uh, and I support him wearing a mask because I'm against the spread of BS. Well, so it, it, it fell flat, and y'all said I, you know, shouldn't do it, and I didn't. So what, what did what did Unashamed Nation say about it, Zach? Because I have no idea. You just told me that some people had sent us some comments. So I want to hear some of them. I, I really hate to read these, um, Al. But, but <laughs> it's I okay. Feel like I'm a, I'm a big I feel boy. Like we gotta, I feel like we got to go there. So you're gonna to, to my surprise. Um, everybody loved it. They said, well, here, "Here's a few of the comments." I may be lowbrow, but I laughed at Al's joke. Thank then you. I rewound it and watched it again. <laughs> I loved Al's joke. Um, I thought it was hilarious. It's okay. I laughed too hard at your joke, Al. Um, Al, I would have given you a standing ovation for that joke. Um, Al, I would have laughed at the Doctor Fakey joke. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, and it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> Probably the one you'll like the most was the one that said from Darren that said, I liked your joke, Al. I think Jace and Zach are closet libs. So, <laughs> <laughs> He's probably right. Right. low I mean, blow. That's a so, low blow there. I well, mean, thank went, you, yeah, Unashamed the, Nation, for, for validating <laughs> what I knew. I knew that was a good joke. It was good. Yeah. So, yeah, we, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to make of that, but I love the icebreaker about Fauci. Yeah. So, you, you I, apparently, Al, the, 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 the joke was a, would have been a hit with this audience. Yeah, right. Well, it's a good thing about And it would have been funny even at WFR. Who did you target at the, you targeted who on this? Well, I was speaking to a young, they, everybody in the room was under 30. They were all young people and they're conservative environmentalists. In other words, they believe in trying to take care of the environment, but through sensible conservative means, not this crazy stuff that the libs are putting out. So that's who I was speaking to. But I wasn't sure if I just didn't connect with them or because I was there to talk about something else. You know, it was just one of those random observation things. For I didn't like the reference to something that would be, I would, that would deem crude language. That was my well, problem with it, and I, and I would I wouldn't have said that at a church setting, but I but I was in a setting with but I thought you saying that makes me even more uncomfortable. If you wouldn't. <laughs> it's like, would you say it if Jesus was sitting across? I would. What, what? I would. I, I told y'all it wasn't. I wasn't referring to a crude term. I was re, re, occur, talking about what my granny always t- more called sensitive. bull shavaki. Yeah. That's the what she said. When I say BS, that's what I'm. Yes, t- I don't know what true. you're thinking. That's true. But I always say bull shavaki. So. Well, the good thing <laughs> yeah, about the human race thinking. is you can always find people to validate whatever you think. <laughs> well, <laughs> the good thing is I had no idea other than there were things I can. You, you and I had not talked about that, so I had no idea they liked. Now it you so. didn't know, but I read it. So I it could have been Jace was be. right. You, that's terrible. And there's a cult born every day. There he is. Well, thank you, <laughs> thank you, unashamed nation. <laughs> <laughs> for making me feel better because I didn't tell that joke in my actually I didn't go down the sarcasm trail I was going to do in my <laughs> sermon because Paul was sarcastic in Second Corinthians ten mm. and I love that because I'm sarcastic I love sarcastic humor and he was very sarcastic about the people that were you know casting dispersion on it and I like that you know I like that he wrote it that way so I was going to go down that road but then I got to preaching and it just never it never went there well. 
you know, so. It's a good day for you. You got some validation. <laughs> it is. We, know, we all need it. It's nice to be vindicated. It really <laughs> it is. I, 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 it does feel good. about vindicated? But <laughs> he, was, he was vindicated. We were he was validated. Was validated by and a vindicated. small group of people. And Dad <laughs> laughed. He, he has a natural react. You laughed when I said that. I mean, here's my I knew it was a joke. That's right. But if you have a million people listening to something and seven of them say, yeah, that was great. <laughs> what does that really say? It? But no, but Dad, if, <laughs> if it had been bad, somebody would have sung out that you know that was you got to look at the look at the percentages percentages. it's the percentages it's a sample size so if the percentage was overwhelmingly supportive Mm -hmm. in the comment section then you have to think extrapolate that out but you're now speaking like a politician now (laughs) but zach is a politician politician. (laughs) no no, i'm a failed actually ran for office that that ran for public off the top which is funny that i'm that someone said i'm a closet liberal uh (laughs) that that, that (laughs) actually is is funny that was the joke but somewhere I, i don't have it at the tip of my tongue but jesus referred to some people as being just a pile of dung that, you, that that was close to what you were saying. Yeah, it's I was close. trying to think of that verse too. It's it very close to what you said. So it's dung, biblical. And he used the term shavaki. Yep. Well, Jesus yeah, said that biblical. in the in the New Testament. Yep. No, Where's that it's at? In one of the Gospels. Oh, uh, you're the light of the Rush world. Limbaugh, who's who's uh, left this uh, world. He uh, he used to say BS was Barbara Streisand, which I thought was pretty funny too. <laughs> <laughs> always go to say. where there is a dead carcass there the vultures will gather <laughs> same well, principle yeah i was thinking about the bill smith line remember when bill smith used to say when he talked about arguing about the scriptures he said never get into a puking contest with a buzzard yeah and you know he was right about that that some sometimes you don't want to waste your waste your time on, on certain things so there's actually I'm, I'm actually looking here there's i have 26 verses about dung. That's in the what Bible. I thought. So it, one of them in there, Jesus so Phil, said it. Yeah, Phil's correct. I'm looking to the Old Testament. There's quite a bit in the Old Testament about dung. Well, I'd rather get to the good news. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I'm ready to. Let's do a podcast about dung. You, you want to do that, Jay? No. Yeah, okay. Well, well, then since we're not going to do that, let's go back to Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 is, is where we left off the last time. And Zach, we had introduced a thought at the end of the last podcast that I thought was really interesting. It's going to take us into verse six because we read the first five verses. And that is the, he's kind of laying out the where, the how, the why. And you you mentioned the who, which is the most important thing. And so this next one is sort of the how they did it in verse six. He says, when everything had been arranged like this, and he had described the layout before he got the the you know the ark of the covenant the gold jar of manna you got Aaron's staff all these things are situated a certain way and then you've got this these two chambers and everything had been arranged like this the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry so this is just what we the, the normal every day they had to be from Levi but they weren't the high priest they were just the priests that did the daily ministry but only the high priest verse seven entered the inner room. That's the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And that only once a year and never without blood, which is an interesting concept, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. That's an interesting thought. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. And that was the the weakness of it. That was it. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of a new order. But But he's careful to say the shedding of blood, this has to be known. Right. But, but the, you know, he's going to finally end up with the blood of animals and all this, you know, but the only way you could get into that inner room is through the blood of Jesus. Right. The blood of somebody. Blood of something. Yeah. And it's interesting, Dad, because the concept really, although you read about sacrifices even way back in Genesis, you know, being done. It's sort of a gruesome thought. It is. And, and you, don't, you don't even read about it. never went back in there without blood the blood of animals and all to show you 
Blood is the only way in. Well, it's been around since the beginning of time, yeah. since since mankind. But you know, the real one, the the symbol one, is the one at the Passover, which was during the ten plagues, and the last one was the the angel of death coming over, and every firstborn in Egypt was going to die that night. And the only thing that would save you is if you had blood of a perfect, you know, a, you know spotless lamb. The blood it, on the door in. On the door. We yeah. need to ask Larry Bowles this when he comes and visits. Yeah, he's going to be on the next podcast. So, Because even when Adam and Eve sinned, you know, the next thing you know, they had animal skins on. You're like, hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. So, I mean. And up until it, that it, point. I mean, it doesn't really make a point of it, but they sin, and the next thing you know, we got they're wearing animal skins. They're wearing well, garments. Th- those animals, I think everybody was happy up until that point, <laughs> or am true. I wrong? Is yeah, that- I mean, I, well, that, no, that's a, that's actually a key point uh, when you go back to Genesis 1 through 3, that, yeah, when, when there was sin, then there was sacrifice and death, uh, and that the animal skin was a foreshadowing of, of a new covering that we'll get in Jesus, right? And the, there's the shedding of blood, the, and the, and which provides new co- covering. But um, well, even and, you read and, the, and also, Zach, on top of that, even, even the flood, even the death of most of humanity also included the death of most animals. And it wasn't, you know, wasn't even their fault. Sin, sin requires a, a gruesome experience, exactly. or something, or somebody. That's exactly right. And when it shows Jace up, mentioned, yeah, Jace mentioned it a few weeks ago, or a few. I don't know when he said this a couple podcasts ago about the idea that there is this thing called wrath, right? There is the, and I, I, I know sometimes the church wants to get away from that because it's not a popular topic, but. Um, but I mean, God, there is there is wrath of God. There has to be atonement, and atonement can only come through blood and through through sacrifice. Um, but well, it is interesting. Well, but this, you know why, uh, Zach? Because you can't. That's why when people say, "Well, all, you know, we just all should all religions should should get along," and you know, who's to say what's right? And what well, we no longer have a relationship that nobody's. Then there's a God that's either that you don't believe in. There's no God, or there there's a God who's not going to hold you accountable. There has to be a standard, plus the of, original of some sort. And when you have a standard, you have you have victory, and you have loss. You have wrath, and you have well, you know, forgiveness. I plus mean, the you, groundwork of the 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 bloodletting comes quickly. I mean, I'm in just Genesis three here. In other words, I will put enmity between you. He's talking to Satan before the blood started flowing, but now the blood has started flowing. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you. And here's the blood part will strike his heel. So there's there will be bloodshed. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. From the original promise, beginning of the promise, from there all the way to Jesus and the book of Hebrews discussing it all. In other words, if y'all look carefully, in other words, it seems to follow a a a thought from Ephesians. Listen to this one. This right here a while ago, it st- just stood out before we got into this in the book of Hebrews. In other words, let's see right here. Yeah, yeah, right here. Uh, look at Jace, you were talking about that text a while ago. For this reason, over in Genesis 9, 15, he wrap, begins to wrap this all up. Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, and those who are called, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. That promise there, if you turn over to Ephesians, Ephesians 3, starting in verse 15 and, six, and 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham. You get down to verse 17. Thus do away with the covenant previously established by God. Thus do away with the promise. And then you get down. That, that's two. And three, it says, 319. It was added because, you know, why, what was the purpose of the law? Because the transgression until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. That's three times. That's Galatians 3, I think, said Ephesians. Yeah, I mean Galatians. Galatians 3, excuse me. Galatians 3. Then is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. 
If the law had been given that can impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, going back to that Genesis 3, so that what was promised, well, that's one, two, three, four, five times right there that that's mentioned. So when you look at it, you say, boy, what a, what a way to... And it was all surrounding what the Hebrew writer's talking about. It, 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 the, the promise is the key here. It is. It couldn't have happened until the blood flowed. Well, well that's why. Well, hang, hang on, let's take a break, Dad. Zach, what underwear are you wearing today? Right now? Yes, right now. Are you wearing I'm, underwear? I'm good. I am. I got my Tommy Johns on uh, right now. As we I speak. was, I was taking a shot there because you could have said, you know, you could have nah. said, you could have said tidy whities, but you went with Tommy John. I knew, I knew. No, too much I'm information now. Too much information. <laughs> well, uh, we're we love our Tommy Johns. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I've been a, a, a super fan for many years. They're very cool in the summertime. They've sold over 17 million pairs, so obviously a lot of people love them as well. Uh, they have a, it's risk free because when you buy a pair of Tommy John's, they have what they call the best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee. So if you don't love them, uh, you can get your money back, but you will, uh, go to tommyjohn.com slash Phil right now. And you're going to save 20% off your first order. So there's 20% off right now. Tommyjohn.com slash Phil. That's tommyjohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. You are going to love your Tommy John's. Well, getting back to Zach's point, though, so it's leading, since I want to focus on the good news. By the way, Jay, that, that for, Hebrews 9, 14 is the one you, you well, said. Well, I'm fixed to read it. Let me read it. That, Let me read it. The blood of Christ is right in the middle of it. Let me read it. We'll start in verse 11. But I want to read Hebrews 2, 2 to Zach's point about the wrath of God, because it says, for if, ain't, if the message spoken by angels was binding, so we're going back to the law, hmm. Mount Sinai, and every violation and disobedience received its just just punishment wasn't that god wanted to punish people it he is a god of love but he's also just yeah it says he's fair he never lies then it says how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation so just think about that phrase how shall we escape if we ignore so if you ignore jesus i don't know what's going to happen but it's not going to be good not good it's not mm -hmm. good so then when you read nine 14, because you say, oh, well, God, he's mean, and he wants to judge people, because, I mean, how shall we escape? That's scary. And we talked about, I think, on the bonus section of one of the podcasts about how these priests that were going in here once a year, it was more about survival than anything. And we talked about the, the legends that had been written that they had a rope tied to their foot. And fear. <laughs> and bells on their head, because if the bells stopped ringing, they thought, oh, did something wrong. God struck, God struck him. And then pull him out. And you couldn't if go, I in, go there, in there. He's going to move from here to that wall. Yeah. But I mean, it was a. <laughs> so it's like it was a survival faith, you know, Ooh. focused on the rest. But then you read 914 after all this. I know I'm skipping ahead, but I like the same phrase. He says, how much more? Of course, he had already said in chapter two, how should we escape if we ignore such a salvation? Well, look what he says here. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Well, if that's not good news, I don't know what is. If you don't realize God is for you, I mean, when that little phrase there that says that uh, Jesus offered himself, when you think about what Jesus did, which is the equivalent to solitary confinement, I mean, he he's in heaven with God, becomes a person, pretty much solitary confinement. He comes down here, and even the people, his closest followers, abandoned him at one point. I mean, there's a reason they outlawed solitary confinement here on the earth in prisons, because they're like, well, it mentally breaks them down. It's like the worst isolation that you could possibly experience, and that's what Jesus does to bring us back to God because he loves us. But he had just said in chapter 2, there, there, there's punishment if you ignore this. And, and I mean, the shedding of blood is the centerpiece of it. 
And the only thing that will make you perfect by the time you get to chapter 10 in Hebrews, the, the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year with the animal. They couldn't make perfect those who draw near to worship. Perfection yeah. comes through the shedding Jesus. of the blood of God on earth. Yeah. And through the work of the eternal spirit. I mean, he just threw that in there. Oh, yeah. Just think about what that does to you. Because we also hey, mentioned. Hey, hey, well, think, Go ahead. I was going to say, think, think about the uh, in Colossians. Let me pull this up real quick. Colossians one twenty one. It says we were once alienated from God and we were hostile. Um, we were enemies in, in our minds because of our evil behavior in our, in our conscience. And so it's interesting here when he talks about the atonement, it's not simply the atonement. It's not, it's not a one way atonement, meaning that the, the, of course the wrath of God is being satisfied, but what also is happening is that our guilty conscience is being cleansed. And so when you go to like uh, Peter's account and when he talks about baptism, what does he say? It's not the water. It's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but what is it? It's a pledge of a good conscience towards God that saves you by the resurrection. So this idea that our conscience, we all had that, that Roman, we've mentioned a few weeks ago, Romans chapter one, um, that our conscience bears witness and so you got this thing in you that that's the, the, in your inner self that's pointing at yourself that's saying you're guilty, and this old and system gonna, had no I'm, way of cleaning that up. And I'm what going to make you through the blood of Jesus. Not only will I remove your sin, I'm making you perfect, perfect like Him. Well, that's that's why I made on the last podcast or two podcasts ago. I said, "What's the number one question the evil one asks you?" He says, "You're not worth anything." You're, 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 you're terrible. You're not good enough. But in actuality, that's what the law did. That's, that's what this reminded you of. I mean, we should say, yeah, that's why Jesus is so spectacular. And look, the clear conscience thing comes down to every thought. I made the point in my sermon last Sunday in Second Corinthians 10. Remember when Paul was talking about the weapons they use? He said, we take captive every thought and submit it to Christ which is such a powerful thing. We think about it in your own mind. And then I asked the question to, to the audience. I said, how, how does an 18 year old kid, because I mean, he's a man, but he's 18 years old, go into a school and start killing a bunch of kids, just shooting them to death. You know, how does that happen? You know how it happened? Cause he started thinking about doing it and, and he thought more about it. And as he descended into the, what finally happened, he took action. That's what happens when you, I, I, here was the line I used. If you don't take captive your thoughts, your thoughts will take you captive. Yep. And that's what we mm -hmm. see. And that's what evil does. It, it, yep. it captivates people. And the, and the further they descend into it, the worse actions result. That's why it starts in our mind or the biblical heart. It starts and there. The exact opposite is, uh, is the fall of the, of the it's the fall of, or the presentation of how lying it starts with lies and then ends up with with <laughs> Satan himself a murder the murderer from the beginning. That's right. That's what it leads to. That's what that's what that's why blood is a result of, of the other way as well. Yep. If you don't have the blood of Jesus as the sacrifice and clear of conscience, Ooh. what you have is the bloodshed of people. And yep. it always yeah, gets down to the same thing. And Salvation with the blood of Jesus and murders and mayhem with the, the evil one. But the evil one. What are you going to yeah, say? Because a, a guilty conscience, when you, in, in terms of like when, when you're in a relationship, if you think about you're in a relationship and you violated the person in that relationship, maybe through uh, you're talking about them, maybe it's adultery or whatever. It, it, and we've all like participated in some form of this. And when your conscience is guilty, then you, it's hard for you to be in an intimate relationship and, and be connected to that person. And so I think what, what this is kind of getting to is this first eight uh, signifies it. And you mentioned it when you read it, Al, you said, that's an, that's an interesting thought. And he says the Holy spirit, is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. So think about what, what was the holy place, the holy of holies in the, in the tabernacle. That was the place where God's presence was. That's right. And, and never, without Jesus. And never without blood, that verse 7 right before 8, 
Never without you, you blood. Don't, you don't get in there without blood. <laughs> but even truthfully, you didn't get in there even with blood of goats and bulls. I mean, the only one that could go in there was who? The high yep, priest. The high priest. So yep. you, you can't. So it, it, it's kind of this futility argument, this futility of thinking. Like, if you want to be in the presence of God, it's like, well, that's not how this system works. You you go in vicariously through the high priest, but you don't really get to ever have direct access to God. I mean, that's not going to happen un- because why? Well, because the blood that's cleaning you is not, it's just not that powerful. I mean, it's, it's bu- goats and bulls. We need a more powerful cleaner. And the only thing that's powerful enough to clean you would be the blood of like a God. But how is that possible? And that's the case I think that's being made through Hebrews here going to that verse that Jace read. You, I mean, he keeps talking about blood and he says in verse 11, but, but, when Christ appeared as a high priest, now you got a new high priest, Christ, of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. So we got a new tabernacle, got a new priest and a new tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation and not through the blood of goats and cattle. Well, thank God, because that was never going to do it. Right. But how did he do it? Through his own blood, he entered the place once for all. So it wasn't continual. I think your your uh, translation said regular. It wasn't a regular thing. It was a once for all. Having obtained, which is past tense, so it's already finished, eternal redemption. You hear the language here. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled those who have been defiled, sanctifying, uh, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, to Jason's point, how much more mm. with the blood of Christ... How much more the blood of God, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to clean your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. That's the thing. Christ's supremacy and preeminence is what gets you in the door into the holy of holies in the presence of God. Good point. That's a great point. Let's take another break. No, and, and that is, in essence, the... It crystallizes everything. He's going to go more deeper into it as we keep going, but that's it in a nutshell. I mean, that really speaks to them. What's interesting is, is he keeps saying to this group of people, now this is, you're going to understand this better. You know, he keeps, he keeps hinting to what's coming because they're still not quite getting it until that temple's gone. A lot of them really just didn't, it, it wasn't hitting home for him, I guess. I mean, it seems to be the kind of the tone of the whole book. They were still wanting to hold on to these rituals, but he kept telling them the rituals can't help you anymore. I mean, there's the high priest won't work anymore. There's this, you know, there's, he's been replaced to Zach's point. And I like the idea too, that it can't be man-made. It can't be by our construction. The only way the presence of God is by what he, he does and who he is. So I, I think that's a, a powerful way to look well, the at question, it. Well, the, the question that, that I think is being asked here is, is how do we enter the holy place? How do we get there? And that's that's the point that he's getting up to. So when you get, I know I'm skipping ahead here, but when you get to Hebrews 10, 19, what, listen to what he says. Therefore, brethren, what does that mean? Well, because of everything I just told you, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Yep. That's the deal. That's how this is. The, the whole thing is, is mo- like this whole argument's moving Towards how how in the world do we do we really get into the presence of God? Like I mean that's that's what everybody's longing which, for. Which is the opposite connection. of that scared you're gonna be struck down. I mean, he he's given us confidence to stand before him. Right. I mean that first John four says that, you know, when we have confidence standing before God because in this world we are like him. Well, where did that come from? He set that into motion when he came down mm-hmm. and gave his life shed his blood, now our conscience can be cleansed and we can receive the Holy Spirit because then it gets into his resurrection. But it also, we, we're actually becoming like him through the Spirit of God that, mm-hmm. that's in us. Right. And the reason, and you think about though, Jason, what if you were that high priest? You were going in there that once a year, You would it would be frightening. You know why? Because you you had your own sin and conscience issues. I mean, yep. you had to you, you had to have something to cover you. The only one that could do it, to Zach's point, is a perfect man who also was God. 
that his sacrifice would be big enough. I mean, that's why when people call me a hypocrite, I'm like, fair, fair enough. Yeah, can't argue that. <laughs> that's true. But most people <laughs> like, yeah, oh, don't call well, me a hypocrite. Oh well, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm like, fair, well, enough. fair enough. I love, have sins. I'll, I love your question that you keep that you said. Are there not the question, but uh, what was the thing you said that Satan's? What does he ask you? I mean, he always or, says or you're he, not good enough. Who you think you are? You're not. Yeah, yeah. you'll yeah, never I, be I good that enough because that—that's what the it's law like a, says. It's like a partial truth. It's it like is. a partial truth. You know, it is it's like truth. what he does in yeah, yeah, he does it in Genesis, right? Right. You know, uh, God didn't want you to eat. Part of what he said was true. If yeah. you eat this fruit, your eyes will be open. You'll know good from evil. Well, that was part was true. Mm-hmm. The part that he didn't tell you was that it's, you don't want that. You know what I mean? No, you but never. It's the same. You can't to, go back. You but need I, to ever. Yeah, you you go, never need to to question the the blood of Jesus, God in flesh. Had to be that chapter six uh, nine through the sixteen start with sixteen Al, and it goes to the end, and every sentence is about the blood. Uh, I mean every sentence. I mean it's about the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Nearly everything had to be cleansed without blood. Without blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. To just on and on. Then then it was necessary then, and then he talks about Jesus again and the blood. But if you ever take lightly the first part of the gospel, which is the death of Jesus on a cross, he shed his blood. We, we somehow we, 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 we get past that too quickly yeah. without stopping yeah. there oh, and saying, yeah. let me just Like you, you, when you stabbed yourself, you realized in that moment, uh, I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of the blood. The blood is precious. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think about, but you know, that's one reason why, uh, you know, we take or participate in in the Lord's Supper every week. And Jesus, yeah, what did He point. say? Right. That's, said, that's what we should be thinking together, about. As often as you yeah. get together, do this in remembrance of me. Like that. So I think the reason why is because He wants us to keep at the forefront of our memory the blood. That's a big deal because without the blood, and that blood right. continues you to know, clean to us the over and over. It's not a one-time deal. So, outsiders they just skip over that like it's like it. Yeah, didn't it makes it. people feel uncomfortable, though. You know, but I mean, but I was I was being. Remember when they was, saw him? Said, "Remember me?" When they first they said, "Look, he he's for what, what's the word when you start eating flesh? Cannibalism." Yeah. He's well, John kind of, six. He's some kind of cannibal here. To, what what in the world oh, we got to this going day? Here? They're still debating. Bill, that. when people are in the religious world and they get to John six, they just move on. Oh yeah. They're like, what? Is, what I eat my flesh? Drink, <laughs> drink my, my blood. This is what? like a weird Hollywood movie that went wrong. Yeah, you know he's cannibalistic, but that's why I was saying, in theory, you don't want to do things that cause us pain and and the loss of blood. I mean, like you stabbing yourself. I mean, when you when you realize, okay, I don't want to do that. But in a way, when Jesus died, and I love this phrase that he introduced, and in a little small uh, way, while you're there, and, and, that pocket knife in my heel. Uh, with the shedding of blood comes pain. Well, right. So we were bought. Well, and Jesus I, that's experienced what I was going to read. Pain for us. Yeah. That's what I was going to read. Jesus is uh, uh, nine fifteen. He's the Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. I mean, then he uses something that you would. Think of in kidnapping here. We, we've we yeah. been hijacked and kidnapped. Well, you're right. talking about us. And he, he's the ransom by the shedding of his blood. And sin has held us hostage. Let's take another break. That's sin why you can, holds us hostage. That's why you can stand up, you know, when the evil one says, yeah, you're not good enough. And you're like, yeah, I should have figured that out by the law. The law should have taught you that. The evil one doesn't have to remind you of that. That's true. And the world, they don't feel good enough either. So what do they say? They say, well, you just need to go find a mirror and say, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And people like me, <laughs> whether they, you believe it or not. But it's like you got to find that deep down in yourself. Everybody wants that identity. But here we are saying, you know what? God made me. He made me and gave me the right to be a child of his. I mean, yep. he gave me. He that. loves so us. He loves it, It's us. a gift. Yeah, it's a it's a gift that he gave me. And what's what's different than any other relationship on the planet is when your son or your daughter messes up 
what do you do? You don't burn a bridge. You, you get a bridge to somehow or another tell them, look, I love you no matter what you do. Well, that's what God did on the cross for us. Yeah. But we do the same thing with our kids. That would really We're be like, a, that would really curtail these young people committing suicide at the rate <clears throat> they're committing suicide. Yeah. You're like, they get to the point now where they say, I'm, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth anything. That's why when we get to Hebrews 12, look, when we get to Hebrews 12, which is uncomfortable for people to read because it's about discipline, a father disciplining his sons, you're like, well, why is he doing that? Because these people came to Jesus and then they said, this is too hard. Yeah. There's too much pain. There, we want to just go back to what we're doing, which was way worse from a uh, confidence level. But it just, when you go public for Jesus, it's just a tough life. It, it's a hard, you're not going to be patted on the back very often. I mean, there's people. But you'll always be able to say, or never say, nobody loves me. You say wrong. Well, right. But I'm well, saying, Jace, lot, I two, think 2,000 years earlier, before the book of Hebrews was written, you had people wanting to go back to Egypt. Well, right. You know why? Because it was too hard. You know? It's man, too hard. What are we going to do out here? He proved his love for us on a cross, but then he also, through the Spirit, he's with us, even though it looks bleak on a, on a normal day-to-day basis, because this is through faith, and life can be difficult. Inside of Jesus or outside, it's just going to be difficult. Yep. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, you know, there's a, a therapeutic approach called narrative therapy where a therapist facilitates a new narrative that a couple can come up with that they can live with to help save their relationship, whatever. And, I, and I've always, like, I hated that because it's, like, it's it's not based in truth. And I, I don't think the answer is to hear what, what the devil's accusing us of and saying, we're not, to, we're not called to create a new narrative that says that we're really awesome because we know we're not in the back of our mind. Exactly. I think what's interesting about the devil, his, the way he operates, is he tells you that partial truth, that, as we mentioned earlier. But but the gospel, here's, here's the thing. It's it's looking at our situation, and because the Hebrew writer's making the same case that the devil would in some regard, that he's saying, you're not good. The big difference is, is there's a, a, a three-letter word after he says that, but. Mm-hmm. And then he gets to Jesus and the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. So our confidence... It's actually very hopeful because if we ever really try to put confidence in ourselves, in our own moral com- ability or compass or achievement, at the end of the day, I mean, I don't care how good you are, man, you know. You know what's in your heart. Your conscience is never going to really be clean. And you're just going to be living a very fragmented life that's not really being honest. And I think what's being offered here through blood through the blood of Jesus is the ability to actually really be clean. So when the devil accuses and says, you're not that good, we don't, we can agree with him and say, I, I agree. And then what we do is we point to Jesus. He said, but he is, but he is. Definitely. And that's why we have confidence. You know, no, I love it. My assistant on the, when she will be in these three way emails or whatever, but she always signs her name. It's like, I'm a nobody, but Jesus made me somebody. <laughs> I love it. Cause we're dealing with people in the world too. And I'm right. like, I wonder what they think about that when they read it. Cause I notice it every time down at the bottom line, but she's right. Well, I want to get mm-hmm. to this nine twenty three Cause I think you, can we get there? Yeah. Well, let me, let me read it. And then you go. Cause, <clears throat> cause Zach asked a really good question. All right. Let me read it down. Where's to that. the door to heaven. So in the case of a will, verse 16, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is in force only when someone has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. So he's obviously talking about Jesus. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. That's his point. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, Exodus 24, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood, both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. Of course, we now know this is, none of this was going to save them. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary, 23, then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. How would that happen? Jesus, 24. 
For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. So that's the lead up for it. Let's take a break, then go. Well, the first, before I get to my point, because I do have a deep water point I want to get into, but I did want to just say well, about this will part, because we all, we're familiar with this. When someone leaves their last will and testament, will and testament. In this case, it's like, it's, it's pretty tricky. It's, I feel like God tiptoed here to make all this work, but it did. Because he says it's necessary to prove the death of the one who made in the case of a will, because a will is in force only when someone, somebody has died. So he died in a public historical way. You can even read about Jesus out dying outside yeah. of the Bible. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. Yeah. Which is a key point, because my point is you can't have a crime without a body. I mean, like, you know, when they say it's hard to convict someone of, of murder when there's no body. Right. So if they would have tried to prove it that way, it would have been like, hmm, well, where, <laughs> where's the body? Right. And so I've always kind of thought in my simplistic mind that he did it this way. So he had to figure out how to have a public death. So it was just... It was so you can establish that there's a new will, right? New covenant, covenant. But Jesus didn't commit a crime. Nope. He he was a sacrificial innocent death, and 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 he and he also and, didn't stay dead. And, well, he didn't stay dead because <laughs> because when he says this, it says a will is in force only when someone has died. Well, he didn't die alone, and, and in fact, he wasn't. <clears throat> but he just. Because it said it was impossible for death. It's like, y'all, you get my on. inheritance <clears throat> after I died and I'm gone. And you look up out there about two weeks later. And there you are. I come walking up out there and say, hey, I said, do we need to give that back? Or? You know what's crazy <laughs> is people do that. They try to pull that off. People will fake their death. Yeah. Try to get the insurance. Yeah. And, and they never their did die. You don't know, leave, a, leave a pinky toe. <laughs> Yeah, you know, in the water at the plane crash site, yeah. they'll cut their toe off <laughs> and said, "No, nope, that the only thing left is a pinky toe. He's dead. Give him the money. Give his family the money." And then two weeks later, he comes walking up with a limp. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying that that's the the way God pulled this off. I mean, there's something in there about that that's that's kind of interesting and awesome in that he's. Dealing with this, having a new covenant and a new way to him, which is through his son, but also being God in that he's indestructible. Right. That's why I go back to that one verse, you know, in Hebrews 7, where it, it just cut to the chase. He's, he's, he's the ultimate high priest because he's indestructible. Now, let's talk about the rest of the stuff he, he did as well. Yeah. But, I mean, at the bottom line is that that is a powerful moment. Well, because it proved his true humanity. That was the point. For for us yeah. to be able to relate to him, we had to know that he would go through that. Another point I think is important is that he chose to come here at a time when the people that were controlling the known world had a way of execution that was probably the bloodiest that's ever been. Oh, yeah. It was brutal. But he yeah. chose to come and do a public death under those circumstances. True. Now, Ooh. I want to bring up some deep water. Just y'all want? Can I do this? You one? got six minutes to do it. I'm gonna give you some deep water. <laughs> so I'm doing a little Greek study of what we're reading here. Everywhere the word "copy" is used in the Book of Hebrews, but one just means a pattern or a yeah. shadow. What we all think, right? And then all of a sudden, in verse 24, of chapter nine, he uses a different word mm -hmm. that's only used one other place in the Bible. So, do I have your do I have your attention? <laughs> So 924, watch. It says, for Christ. Now, he says copies in 23. It's a different word. It was In 23, it says it was then necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things. So all these things that were just a pattern that was right. foreshadowing. So he gets to 24, and he says, for Christ did not enter it. Now, listen to this. A man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. Well, he's a different word here. Well, the word means like any type of. Like like the opposite, but but 
corresponds to it. So I was like, why would he use that, that phrase right there? So I looked up the only other place where it's used, and you're not going to believe what word it is. It's in 1 Peter 3, 21. Hmm. Now, off the top of your head, I know what you, you know what about. that is. Yeah. So this word... Uh, so Symbolizes yeah, symbolized in the NIV and yeah. the other version it says corresponding. They put it at the, it's actually the first word. It should have be symbolizing, but, or corresponding. So when you read 321, then I'm going to make a point and then y'all can talk about it. So he says, uh, he's doing this illustration about, you know, he goes through the gospel. Peter reminds you of the gospel in 18 for Christ died for sins once and for all the unrighteous, unrighteous to bring you to God which is basically what we're discussing in mm -hmm. Hebrews, yep. right? Mm -hmm. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. We just talked about that. And then he has this moment where he preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago. That's why I said he really wasn't dead. He just didn't have his body back yet. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people ate and all were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism. So it's the same word that's, that copy is symbolizes. So it's an antitype that corresponds to something else. Mm -hmm. Well, when you go back to Hebrews 9 and, and see what was the what was the antitype corresponding to, it says Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was a copy of that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself. So when you go to back to first Peter three, it says th this water copies baptism, but it's, so it's an antitype. So it's water and baptism. It's the water, it's the physical water, mm -hmm. but it's an antitype that corresponds, corresponds to what? Well, this whatever's happening in the water, the the whatever the the consequences are. So you see where where it's going with this. It's like Jesus. He's like, this is not about this earthly thing. And in in the case of First Peter three, it's not it's not about the water. Just, just you know, he was using that from knowing the ark. I right. mean, he picked out the most famous act of water the earth has ever known. There was a flood where the whole thing was destroyed. Deluge. Yeah, and he's like, this water is a copy to baptism. But but he wasn't saying it was necessarily about the water. What was it about? It was not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then back to Hebrews 9, it says in 24, he, he entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. I just thought it was interesting when he used that word to try to try to share this earthly to the heavenly in both cases. Right. That don't get hung up. And what do people do? They get hung up on the physical act of baptism. They get hung up on the physical act and they're missing the whole point, which both in both cases was what Jesus made available to us, which was heaven itself. No, I think that's I think that's good. I think it's, and it's a good way to drive home the point because I think the key there is that, and Zach mentioned this earlier, the idea was that the presence of God was in the most holy place, but really that was never his permanent presence. Yeah, His permanent presence is heaven. It's outside of this earth. I mean, he made this, and he's certainly everywhere, but the idea is to be with him is the ultimate. So I think your archetype works I mean, perfect. I, for I brought well, it up because most people say baptism is a symbol. And when in actuality, if you look at it, it said water right. was, the was the symbol, symbol. of baptism. And his point was, it was a copy an antitype to something greater. Right. So it's like well, and, they and, made one little leap there and all of a sudden made it out something to be not exactly what his point was. Right. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, uh, especially when you get to First Peter, which I brought this up earlier, not knowing you were going to go there. I was I brought up First Peter to correlate it to Hebrews nine fourteen, well, when it talked Greek, about being cleansed from the conscience. Yeah, the, right. your, well, the, your conscience the Greek, is clean. The Greek led me there. There's only two places where that antipas or however you pronounce it is is mentioned. 
And I just thought that well, was that, ironic. Well, well, listen, listen to what how what to refer back to this idea of getting a clean conscience through the blood of Jesus. That that's exactly what he's getting at in First Peter three as well. When he exactly. corresponds the waters of Noah to baptism, that he says, which now saves you also, baptism. But it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. What is it? It's the pledge of a good conscience towards God that saves you by the resurrection. Mm-hmm. The reason why you can pledge a good conscience towards God is because of the resurrection of, a, of Jesus, whose blood was splattered all over the place exactly. for us. It, that, that's that's the deal. So it's all to, so that we can enter the holy of holies. So did y'all get my joke? I said I was going to take joke? it. I was going to take it to the deep water. <laughs> Deepest water ever was when Noah. <laughs> See, that's funny. I think that's See, funny. Thank you. Yeah. I can yeah. I did that whole thing to get around Al telling this joke <laughs> to have a joke embedded into something really yeah. deep. Yeah. Jesse, you're trying too hard. <laughs> So make sure you leave, make sure you leave a comment. We want to know. Put was unashamed Jesus. nation. If if my twenty minute interlude of deep theology with a weave of a joke was a better a than the uh, cringe, the doctor joke of Al. Cringeworthy. So puns. who did it? Who the question is? Who did it better? Who, who did told it better? the better That's joke? Right. Mono a mono. I want to hear. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about this in our overtime. It's uh, blazetv.com slash unashamed if you want to follow us over for a few more minutes on this topic. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.